Good morning. Today's wisdom lesson was published in Vanity Fair on December 1st, 2015. One of the most prominent stains on the rep reputation of the much mythologized Reagan administration was its response or lack of response to the AIDS crisis as it began to ravage American cities in the early and mid 1980s. President Reagan famously, though not famously enough, didn't himself publicly mention AIDS, AIDS until 1985, when more than 5,000 people, mostly most of them gay men, had already been killed by the disease. Filmmaker, filmmaker Scott Kalinenko, new documentary short, When AIDS Was Funny, shows how the Reagan administration reacted to the mounting problem in chilling fashion. Not even Reagan's appointed mouthpiece, notorious press secretary Larry Speaks, had much to say about the crisis beyond derisive laughter. Control in Atlanta that AIDS is now an epidemic, we have 600, over 600 cases. And, uh, no, over a third of them are not. It's known as gay plague. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, it's a pretty serious thing that uh, one in every three people that get this have died, and I wonder if the president is aware of it. I don't have it. Are you? Do you? You don't have it. Well, I'm relieved to hear that. I, I, do you? No, you, didn't, you didn't answer my question. Well, wondered, How do you know? Does the president, in other words, the White House looks on this as a great joke. No, I don't know anything about it, Lester. You, you, what, does the president, we, does anybody at the White House know about this epidemic, Larry? I don't think so. I don't think there's been Nobody any. Knows. There's been no oh, personal right, experience right. here, Lester. No, I mean... I thought you were keeping Dr. I checked thoroughly with Dr. Ruge this morning, and he's had no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no patients he, he suffered from AIDS or whatever it is. The president doesn't have gay plague. Is that what you're saying or what? No, didn't say that. Didn't say that. I thought I heard you on the State Department over there. Why don't you stay over there? <laughs> because, because I love you, Larry. Oh, that, I that's see. Fine. Well, I, <laughs> let's don't put it in those terms, Lester. <laughs> oh, I retract that. <laughs> I hope so. Tales are not true, and this one's true. Lester's ears perked up when you said fairies. <laughs> he has an abiding interest in that. Yeah, it was, it was 1981 when the White House spokesperson, Larry Speaks, made fun of the first reporter who asked about the Reagan administration's response to the AIDS crisis. Speaks continued for more than a year to make gay, taunting jokes aimed at the reporter the Reverend Lester Kinsolving, whenever the topic came up. Now, Ronald Reagan is remembered as a, a hero of Republican politics, and even though we, we could say a lot here about how his tax policies destroyed the middle class and literally killed the American dream, I want to drill down today on this specific issue of the early federal lack of response to the discovery of AIDS. Now you can say this recording we just played was from 1981, nearly two generations ago. Times were, were different then. People were not nearly as woke as we would expect a national politician to be today. 
But like most of you, I remember 1981. I was in my second year of graduate school at Vanderbilt. <laughs> and I'll be perfectly honest with you, I was still plagued by the curse of my hillbilly upbringing that did not prepare me, either in spelling or in grammar, to write papers for my Vanderbilt professors. I have to apologize for the redaction in the middle. That's, uh, in those days, they actually put our social security number on our student IDs. My rural Kentucky education left me in a position of real deficit in many areas of cultural awareness, but I can tell you this. I was 25 years old, emerging from the cesspool of Appalachian prejudices, and I knew better than to make fun of someone for being gay or to imply that being gay was a bad thing. This is not scientific research in any way, it's purely anecdotal reflection, but I'm just saying that even though it was 40 years ago, a barely out of the woods Kentucky hillbilly knew that the AIDS crisis was serious and that it was anything but a laughing matter. But someone who had been the governor of California and had become the president of the United States did not know. And that is an alarming juxtaposition. How sobering it is that someone could have become the president of the United States and not have even a modicum of awareness of how serious this issue was. More than 600,000 Americans have died from AIDS since 1981. Millions more are HIV positive. It's, it's difficult to tell how a quick and decisive response to AIDS when it was first identified might have changed the course of history. But I think it's safe to assume that we could have saved as many as a half a million lives if we had not fallen prey to this derisive and irresponsible response of the Reagan administration. I don't mean for this to just be numbers. I did the funerals for a lot of those people. I knew them personally. Tens of millions are living with HIV virus now who might have been spared that health challenge if the Reagan administration had bothered to give a damn. Joseph Stalin is reputed to have said, I don't know if he did or not, if he did he was loosely quoting a German author, but he said to have said, the death of one person is tragic. The death of two million people is a statistic. No matter who said it first, it's an observation that we ought to think about, isn't it? Our friend Ned Goodwin has uh, spoken here about his time in management in Walmart when if an employee shoplift a candy bar on their way to the break room, they could be arrested, handcuffed, and escorted off the property. Again, shoplifting at Walmart earns you a criminal record, willfully and negligently ignoring the rise and spread of AIDS such that more than 600,000 mostly gay Americans die. And you get federal buildings named after you, highways, schools named after you, and two generations of politicians who want to claim to be the inheritors of the Reagan legacy. One person shopping at, 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 or shoplifting at Walmart is a tragedy, 600,000 dead homosexuals is a statistic. And a statistic that many Reagan fans will become indignant if you simply remind them of it. And this is one of the strange things about my job. Stating facts makes people angry. I didn't kill them. Reagan killed them. But people get mad at me for saying it. It's nonetheless true. And this is the real rub for me, and I hope for you as well. It appears that it is up to the church, specifically the progressive church, to be prophetic truth-tellers. Not just to hate on dead presidents, but to adamantly assert that we will not stand idly by when minorities are oppressed and targeted when the plight of the poor is ignored, or when governments, our own or any other, 
decides to start a military conflict under unjust circumstances. Again, in 2001, when the Bush administration first began to beat the drums of war against Afghanistan and then Iraq, I was railing against the wars from the elevated pulpit in a local denominational church, and one of the sweetest little old ladies in the world called me one day and said through her thick southern accent, Now, Roger, I know that you know that I love you, and you just are the smartest man, but do you really believe that you know more than our president about whether or not we should go to war? And I, and I get it. I was just a preacher in southern Missouri who evidently had not learned that you don't wear a short sleeve shirt with a tie <laughs> and, God forbid, matching suspenders. <laughs> but George W. Bush was a national executive with the wisdom of the CIA and the FBI and advisors from the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and Marines. Who was I to second guess him? With some real trepidation, I replied, well, Miss Ann Routes, I do believe that in this case, I know better than the President of the United States. <laughs> Thank you for that tepid response. <laughs> No, it wasn't that I had information that Bush didn't have, but you know that, that ancient proverb that may go all the way back to Erasmus, that in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Uh, not that I want to make my own life sort of the yardstick of history, but at 62, I've been almost more places than Forrest Gump. But <laughs> it wasn't that I was better informed. It was that I brought conscience to the exchange because in the land of the blind, a one-eyed one person could be king. Bush certainly had more information than I had. As seems unavoidable at this point, he was just willing to ignore the facts. He was willing to manufacture propaganda and orchestrate or at least bless wars that have killed more than a quarter of a million innocent citizens. Now, yes, let me be quick to say, the approximately 3,000 Americans killed on 9-11 were innocent. None of them deserved to die. None of them deserved the fate that befell them on September 11th. But then, on the same hand, do you think any of those peasant farmers in Afghanistan or children playing in the streets of Baghdad or university students in Iraq were any less innocent than the people that happened to go to work on the wrong day on September 11th of 2001. Like anyone, I was and I am horrified by the murderous terrorism committed against the United States on that day, but I am also horrified by the fact that our military response was to kill hundreds of thousands of people who had nothing to do with it that we have now killed in the years of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, we have killed more than a hundred times as many people as were killed that day on 9-11. A hundred times as many. And somehow we are inured to that fact. Al-Qaeda was bad, but what we've done is a hundred times worse. We don't think of ourselves as Al-Qaeda, do we? We somehow just skip over that morally. One American death is a tragedy, but a quarter of a million deaths in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq, is it even a statistic if we just refuse to mention it? Look, people, I take no pleasure in this, but please indulge me. Before 9-11, Vice President Dick Cheney was looking for an excuse to invade Iraq. George Bush, for reasons that defy rational explanation, went along with a case for war that was based on what he knew to be cooked intelligence married to pure and obviously false propaganda. 
And then Secretary of State Colin Powell took that fake propaganda to the United Nations and sold this war to the world. Again, not trying to be pedantic here, but you shoplift at Walmart and you're taken away in handcuffs. Commit crimes that kill hundreds of thousands of people, cost American taxpayers $2 trillion, and you get to go on lecture tours being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars per appearance. How does, how, how does this happen? I went to hear Colin Powell speak at MSU right, right here in town just a few years ago, and I fully expected him to show some remorse and to talk about how he had been played into playing a role in selling this war uh, to the world. But what I saw was a man who nearly broke his own arm patting himself on the back for what a wonderful role he had played in history. And you know, I'm not exaggerating. <clears throat> His narcissistic diatribe was regularly interrupted by thunderous applause, cheers, and a standing ovation. In 2014, more than a decade after his malevolent and disastrous performance at the United Nations had been revealed for the hypocrisy and lies that it was, and no mention was made of his war crimes, of his heinous role in this war, but rather he was literally greeted like a hero at MSU and held up to the students as a role model. For obvious reasons, there were no live questions that day taken from the audience. We had to submit them on note cards and they selected the fawning, sycophantic softball questions on note cards read. Needless to say, they didn't read any of mine. <laughs> All of this is obviously relevant to our situation today. Though we have obviously taken great strides from the time of the Reagan administration um, when they thought that AIDS was funny, but please don't think the battle is over. This dichotomy of how we react to tragic information is still very alive. During the Obama administration, it became legal for gay people to get married, yay. It became legal for members of the armed forces to come out of the closet. But in the past two years, the Trump administration has done what they can to roll back all of that progress. Trans members of the armed forces have suffered a reversal of policies in the military. Under the excuse, now this is the excuse given, because the cost to the military of gender reassignment surgery was too expensive. Ignoring the fact that the military currently spends 10 times as much on erectile dysfunction pills for male servicemen than they have ever spent on transgender health care. And if you're the sort of person that keeps records of such things, Trump's golf trips have cost taxpayers 10 times as much as the military ED pills and transgender health care uh, during his time in office. More than $3 million per weekend golf outing, most of which is paid to the resorts that he owns. I've never been terribly interested in learning how to play golf, but if I could pocket a couple of million dollars every weekend when I went out on the links, I might take an interest in it. But if I may return for a moment to my conversation with the lovely Mrs. Ann Rout some 16 years ago. She was, in the most polite and loving way possible, not really challenging my facts. The fact of stating that the president was lying about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, or some squirrely connection between Saddam Hussein and nuclear material, or Al-Qaeda. She was simply asking me, to stay in my lane. I could talk about the Bible. I could even talk about sin and how y'all ought to quit it. <laughs> I could talk about addiction or divorce, infidelity. I could even talk about shoplifting at Walmart. I just wasn't supposed to talk about the murder of 600,000 innocent civilians because that's outside my jurisdiction. 
And here is both my summation of what is wrong with almost every church in America and the thing that I hope this church never, ever, ever falls prey to. While Erasmus was essentially right in saying that the one-eyed person in the land of the blind could well be king, but the blind might really prefer that that one-eyed person would just shut the heck up. Or as the modern take on the proverb goes, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man will poke out his eye to fit in. It was not politically expedient for the media to press Reagan about the fact that they were ignoring the spread of AIDS when they could have stopped it. It was not politically expedient for the media to call BS on Cheney, Bush, and Pell in the lead up to these two insane wars. In fact, they helped them to sell it. It is not currently politically expedient to talk about the fact that Russia seriously hacked our 2016 presidential election and probably, with the help of Donald Trump, got Donald Trump elected. It is not politically expedient to talk about Trump's involvement in money laundering for the Russian mafia, about illegal emoluments in the form of loans and real estate deals with Saudi Arabia and Russia. It's not even politically expedient to ask Bob Mueller why, even if he felt he could not indict a sitting president, why he was willing to indict 32 people, including George Papadopoulos, Paul Manafort, Rick Gates, Michael Flynn, Richard Pindo, uh, Alex Vanderswan, Michael Cohen, and Roger Stone, but he never even called in to be interviewed such obviously involved up to their eyebrows characters like Don Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Ivanka Trump. Never even talked to them. All I'm saying is that political expedience has nothing to do with who we are. In fact, folks, if you find that you fit into a society that is so full of lies and deception and corruption, then I suggest that proves that something is wrong, desperately wrong, spiritually, morally wrong. Thomas Paine wrote in the, the days leading up to the American Revolution that these are the times that try men's souls. That is to say, we are in the midst of the kind of crisis that's going to reveal who we really are. When we started this church, we wrote in our mission statement that we wanted to be a prophetic voice for social justice expressing it in honest and academic theology. That was our goal. We had no idea, <laughs> we had no idea what was gonna happen in our country in the years that, that followed. Thomas Paine wrote in Common Sense, history has found us. Our first eight years were the eight years of the Obama administration. That was when we were just getting our legs under us. And by comparison, those were scandal-free, halcyon days. I still found things to get mad about and, and, and preach about all hot under the collar, but I had no idea what was coming down the tracks. We didn't predict how history would unfold. We didn't accurately envision what our role in it would be. But these are the times that try the souls of women and men. We didn't go looking for this fight. But this fight found us. His, history came to us. The media is hardly proving themselves to be reliable. Even the much lauded Bob Bueller has shown himself to have some real feet of clay and a Congress that has sworn to uphold the Constitution. That's the one thing they swear they're going to do. Is now acting like they've never read it. Or at least they are unwilling to follow its dictates into a, the inconvenience of a politically fraught battle. Amen. Into that vacuum of leadership, that vacuum of honesty, integrity, and courage is exactly where we have to go. Without the prophetic voice of communities of faith, I don't think there's much hope that the public will ever hear it. History has found us, and men and women, we must stand up to meet that day in history. Thank you for watching our videos. 
We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.